Welcome, everybody, to Beersmith Podcast number 72. We've got Michael Moraz coming on today to talk about Belgian Golden Strong Ales. I think you're going to enjoy that episode. I actually have uh, three announcements today. We just launched Beersmith Radio at beersmith.com slash radio, where you can listen to our podcast streaming 24-7. So I've got all 72 episodes up there now at beersmith.com slash radio, and you can stream that to your iPhone, your Android phone, uh, your computer, just about any uh, device that you have. And there's links there at beersmith.com slash radio. Uh, the second announcement I have is I've been updating all the videos for Beersmith at beersmith.com slash video. I have uh, video tutorials there, uh, literally dozens of them, that'll walk you through how to create recipes in Beersmith, how to use your desktop version, how to use your mobile version, how to use the Beersmith cloud, and our Beersmith recipe site at beersmithrecipes.com. So I encourage you to go to beersmith.com slash video and check out the new video tutorials. And finally, I wanted to mention our new sponsor, uh, crittercutter.com. Uh, the Critter Cutter is a uh, very neat little tool here. It has a uh, sharp beak, and I'm holding it up on the video there. It has a sharp beak for uh, for uh, prying off caps off the bottles, as well as opening boxes. And you can use the tail to uh, open uh, all of your bottles. And you go to CritterCutter.com to try that out. I've got a, a nitride finish one I've been carrying around for about a month, and I've really enjoyed it. It's a great little gadget there. Again, that's CritterCutter.com, our new sponsor, CritterCutter.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to go into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Moraz, whose latest project is launching Moraz Brewing Company in El Dorado Hills, California. Uh, we discussed that on episode 57 of this podcast. His website is MorazBrewingCompany.com. That's M-R-A-Z BrewingCompany.com. Mike also is an award-winning home brewer. He's won California Home Brewer of the Year twice in a row and also won awards at the national level. He was on uh, Beersmith Podcast 42 discussing sour beers. It's uh, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you good doing? To be back on, very good. It's good to be back on the show. How are you doing, Brad? I'm doing good. Yeah. Happy holidays. That's for sure. We're recording this right before, uh, well, it's going to be broadcast probably in early January, but uh, recording it during the holiday season here. I don't think there's ever a non-busy time, so... Always something going on. <laughs> yep. Well, today we're going to talk about Belgian uh, Golden Strong, and I was wondering if you could uh, start with just a little bit about the history of that style. Yeah, um, obviously, uh, you know, I thought I knew a little bit about the style, and, and I think the best way to become an expert is to become a teacher, so I had to dig in the notes and look at some history and make some phone calls. Um, I actually found out that it's pretty young style, um, as far as beer is concerned, it's more, um, you know, we think of Belgian styles being, you know, with the starting hundreds of years ago with the monks and everything else. But this beer is style is less than 100 years old. Um, it kind of transpired from the Industrial Revolution and all the German loggers and such that are coming over into the country. Um, you know, the lighter more refreshing style beers instead of the big heavy sweet ones and high alcohol. This beer um, was kind of developed to combat some of the German and some of the imports that started coming in through the train systems and with the, the advent of cold box cars and, and such like that, that they needed a beer that would be light and refreshing but still have its own little character as such. Um, the history that I found the Duval um, was more of the first ones that started it. I think Mugrat, I can't. I think that's how you pronounce the owner's yeah. name, who started the company. Um, back in 1871, he started um, this brewing company. And it seemed to be there was a brewery on every corner. I guess it was even more than it is now as far as just it was just overwhelming. And obviously with so much market and there was obviously the price of beers were going down. And then you had imports coming in. So the Sun um, expanded the brewery in the 1900s. And about the time of World War I, um, they decided to search out uh, a, a different yeast strain that would be a little bit more cleaner. Um, and they found one in Scotland. Um, and they brought some over and they started brewing a beer after World War I called Victory Ale. Um, and it's similar to the blonde styles of the time, um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what it is. I think it, the only similarities in, far, in the Belgian um, 
Trappist beers and such is that that blonde category. Um, so it's not really closely related to doubles or triples or. No, um, it's it's kind of a beer on its own. It, it's got more relationship and similarities to a uh, Belgian blonde. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much pretty much a Belgian blonde on steroids. Um, and I think Michael Jackson is probably the, f- if not the first, you know, right around the time of him doing his beer explorations, called it a Belgian Golden Strong. I think it was a strong blonde or such um, at the time. So that's kind of where it. Um, there's it's kind of fuzzy and who knows exactly who started what, but um, it seems to be right around the you know the victory ale, the World War One time. Um, that's where the beers started to take off, um, and Duval is. I don't know who else was brewing them early on. Um, the, there's talk of through the '60s and such that, that you start seeing some more of, more and more of those styles come along. I'm sure there was other breweries that did it. But I just couldn't find any information on them. Well, there's quite a few commercial examples today, though, isn't there? Uh, yeah, there is. You know, it's it's a nice style. It's light, refreshing um, style. It's got a lot of flavor and a lot of character. Um, and you can, it's a nice beer in the winter time. It's a nice beer in the summertime. I think it kind of fits all occasions. Uh, so that it it makes sense that you're going to see more and more of those. And obviously, with the American interpretation, we kind of put spins on things and not so style perfect. So. So what, what, what could somebody pick up in their local store? Maybe uh, I think Russian River makes a great one, and uh, there's a few others, right? Yeah, I'll give you some on the West Coast, and you can give me some on the East Coast. How's that? Um, so we have uh, North Coast Mix Prankster, which is probably one of the older styles. Um, they've been around for quite some time. Um, very nice beer. Uh, Duval is probably, you know, that's the benchmark that everybody, um, when you have that style and you, you're kind of judged against the effervescent of that and the clean and the color of that beer. So, you know, which it's not a bad place to put a benchmark. Um, Russian River makes uh, Damnation. Uh, let's see, Lost Abbey makes, uh, I think, Inferno um, out here in the West Coast. Uh, Brooklyn Beer Mix, I think it's, they make one also. Number one, I think it's called. Is that, do you, yeah, you guys think, get that I over there? I think that's right. Yeah, I think yeah. that's correct. Um, um, you know, in, and then you can go a little bit worse. I mean, not worse, but a little bit more on the fringe. Um, Jolly Pumpkin makes one that's fabulous also. Um, you know, those ones have a little bit more character to them, a little bit more spices, a little bit, a little tartness to them. So, you know, the, the, the style guidelines are kind of widening on, on some of the Belgian style beers. So, Mike, how would you uh, how would you describe the style overall? Um, very light in color, pale in color. Um, you start getting into the yellow and golds. I think it starts. People start seeing. And that's some of the, the terminology is like, well, is it a triple? Is it a golden? Is it a blonde? So, I, I think it's nice if you can keep it on the lighter end of the color scale. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Carbonation is important. We, you know, if that's bottle conditioning on this beer is. Probably one of the most important things, well, as far as presentation, it, it does. If you have a flat one, it's just not the same beer. Um, it, the carbonation, uh, the carbonic bite add does add a, another layer of complexity to it. I think that's nice. So that's important. Um, and just being in balance, nice little spicy notes, the fruit notes that you get for the Belgian yeast, all those little things. It, it's a nice beer because uh, it doesn't have a whole bunch of one thing it's just a nice marriage of flavors how uh let's switch over to brewing it how would you uh how would you start what's uh what you know what would you start at for the grain bill for example if you're going to brew one um i would mostly use uh all pilsner malt and just maybe anywhere less than five percent of um specialty malts you can use it all depends on um your brewing system and style. I've used, um, you know, single malt, single hop, and this is a great beer to do that because the yeast is the forefront of this beer. So you can use all. You can use a German pilsner. You can so you, use, you've actually done it smash style, huh? With yeah, a single malt, really, single hop. Yeah, and that was one of the. F- this is the first style of beer that I brewed. Um, I've always been a fan of Belgians before I was brewing, and obviously these beers are the more expensive ones. It's, why make a pale ale when you can make a beer that's ten dollars a bottle at the local store? So, um, and you f- you find out they're not really that expensive to make. They're not easy to make um, because of all the 
the um, complexities and, and nuances that go into it. But I think it definitely sharpens your brewing skills and understanding yeast management. And that's and fairly it's fairly strong beer, so you need yeah. a fairly robust grain bill, right? What's what's the original yeah. gravity shoot range roughly? Um, it's right around here. I'll get you the exact. Oh, it doesn't notes. have to be exact. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I just looked up the BJCP. It's right around sixty. 1065 to 1095. So it's pretty robust uh, starting, beer. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking, um, you use mostly, uh, I use a German Pilsner malt because mm-hmm. it, it's nice modified. I have good results with it. Um, I use it as a home brewer and I use it still Weirman's as a professional. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously you're going to need some sugar to lighten the beer up. Um, so you can use anywhere from 5 to 30%. Um, it all just depends on wh- what you're looking for. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about sugar for a minute. Uh, you know, I, lo- I know a lot of people like buying expensive yeah. Belgian candy sugars, and I've had other people tell me, you know, table sugar is perfectly fine or corn sugar is perfectly fine. Uh, what's your preference there? Um, Costco. Costco. <laughs> You get candy just sugar the, there, or do you get? No, you, we just get the C and H bag of just regular. I use they have an organic like a blonde sugar, which is kind of similar to tor, tor, turbinado sugar. Okay, um, um, it is not as rummy, uh, so we use a little bit of that in some of our Belgian beers um, and the light ones, and then we use just mostly just regular cane sugar or beet sugar. Right, because the one. sugar sugar doesn't yeah. add much flavor. It's really most of it just ferments out, right? Yeah, you're gonna. T- it's pretty much you're just trying to dry the beer out and add a little bit of alcohol, which adds a little bit of mouthfeel and sweetness to the beer. So, so, so you, that's it. so you're using plain table sugar, basically. Yep, that's what we use. Awesome. I've used beet sugar. I've used cane sugar. I don't use corn sugar because I just never use it as a home brewer, and it's easier for me to get cane or, or beet sugar out here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if, I mean, corn sugar is fine. They're all you know. They all. Some people say they uh, add. Uh, different nuances and different flavors. Um, I know the Terminado sugars and the Muscovados and all those, the darker um, sugars do add some rumminess to it. So if you're looking for a little bit of complexity without uh, going over the top, um, you can play with the sugars instead of the um, instead of the grain. That's now, a nice you, way to add some complexity oh, to it. Sorry. Do you prefer to add the sugar to the boil? or I do. I usually add it about halfway through. So, And the reason for that is it's, it's a fairly – stronger beer just with the grain bill mm-hmm. um you know and we'll let the 60 or 90 minute hop additions kind of get through their um bittering and then we'll add the sugar at 30 minutes safe so i've never had any issues with scorching or anything with that with the sugar so um it's I've, that's kind of the process that I've, I've always done and mm-hmm. and uh it still seems to work on the bigger scale now what about mashing are you doing any uh, special mashing schedule or are you uh any particular temperature? Are you shooting for a light end or, or heavy end of the scale? We shoot for a light end, um, mm-hmm. right around 150. I mean, and that's another, we can talk about how to do a Golden Strong. If you have the ability to step mash, um, by all means, you can do it with this style. I've done it a few times, and it does help dry the beer out. Um, did I see a difference between so, adjusting my my step, my infusion temperature, um, you know, maybe from a 148 to a 152 versus... The infusion, you know, so step as, as you go along, slowly warm it up. Uh, I didn't see much of a difference uh, in the I, – I have an issue on the professional side. Obviously, I can't do that. My brewing system won't let me do that. And I was worried on a home brewer side of being consistently evening the temperature up the same scale every single time. So, so when you say a step mash, what, uh, what steps are you using in this particular you case? Can, so – on the perfect world, if you want to do a Belgian strong and if you have it available to heat up the mash, yeah. you can start in the um, right around 140 mm-hmm. and slowly heat it up all the way up to 165 throughout um, a two-hour period. Wow. And that'll give you a nice slow uh, heat up uh, conversion to all the alpha, beta, amylase ranges um, and it helps completely dry the beer out. So it's almost um, almost like doing a lager mash where you might do uh, you know something at 148, something at 154 or so, right? Yeah, and, you're, and this beer has a lot more in common with lagers than I realized as far as the mash regimen that some of the professional breweries use. Um, Duval does do a, a step mash that is similar to that, that he, they run through the whole um, – range of temperatures to help finish dry the beer out. Uh, it's just, I know there's 
the perfect world and there's the real world as far as being able to get things done and it's easier for us just to do a single infusion and and play with the the you know the end result mm-hmm. uh, and adjust the temperatures as needed and we shoot for the you know 150 area for this beer but your real goal here is just to get it as dry and and complete completely converted as possible right yeah you don't want any cloyingly sweet sugar because the fact that it is bigger in alcohol and, and you're trying to make a nice, light, refreshing, sharp beer and any residual sugar definitely impedes on that flavor. Mm-hmm. Well, what about um, hop varieties? Which, uh, which hop varieties do you prefer and what, what sort of a hop schedule? Most of them, um, I use all German Magnums and Slovenian um, steering goldings and super steerings, um, which is, I think that they're Aurora is actually the other name of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are the ones I use. So any Noble Hops, nice. Saws are also well. Uh, Duval uses saws and steering goldings. Um, there's a lot of reference to um, saws and steering goldings and Magnums. They all have a nice spicy flavor, all noble, nothing. I would stay away from the American hops because um, you, you really don't want those flavors in this particular style. Mm-hmm. Even though it's not a hop forward beer, they do come through because it's such a, a, a light beer. You, you'll still get some um, of the uh, uh, American hops coming through. And it's fairly so, uh, fairly light on hops, really, right? It's at the low end of the bitterness scale, right? For um, for the amount of alcohol it is, it's yeah. 25 to 35 um, is right around the range that I like to see. Um, there's obviously – there's beers at other ends of the scale and we make one that's actually 45 ibus um here at the brewery mm-hmm. um so it's a little bit out of the textbook hop range but i think on the west coast i'm not saying we have to do that i i, I wanted a nice belgian strong that would stand up to a lot of the ipas and, and you know when you have a couple of beers and you go back to a, a belgian people say that well they're too sweet and it's well that you're missing the hop character and it's it's a perception of sweetness so, so if i do um, a bitterness ratio most of them are around a half or even a little bit less than a half right yeah that would be a, a good safe place to be yeah and then we're looking for most of the hops obviously at the the 90 minute or 60 minute um and that's another thing about the pilsner malt make sure you got a good boil um uh, at least 60 minutes. Um, I usually, m- mine is done at 70 minutes just to make sure we have all the, um, you know, the boiling the, the, the wort nice, nice. Yeah, and get the DMS clean. out and all that you stuff. You want to get all the DMS off. And then, uh, so, you know, you'll see a lot of people recommend 90 minute boils on that. So and that's a good, you know, you can, if you're going to do a 90 minute, might as well do a 90 minute hop edition and save some money on some hops and use the extra bitterness because that's you're just looking for bitterness at that point. Um, so, so I assume you're not doing any finishing hops, dry hops, whirlpool hops on this, right? No dry hops, no whirlpool, but we I do like to add a little bit around 20 minutes mm-hmm. just to give a little more flavor, a little bit of character, let the hops, the spiciness come through, um, and that's where the noble hops play in um, to be able to give just a little bit of finish on those. So you're looking maybe anywhere from two to five IBUs out of those, so not much. Just a little bit, just to give it a little bit of character. And that's personal preference. If you want just one super clean, no hop character, just mostly yeast, you can just you know, tame that down or leave it out. It's totally up to you how you – and that's, that's what's nice about it. Now, what about uh, working with yeast? You mentioned yeast is really important, critical to this uh, particular style. Um, yeah, obviously there's the, the Duval strain of yeast, and if you've ever used it as a home brewer, it's not the easiest yeast to use. It, it doesn't flocculate well, um, but it does leave um, very nice spicy and fruity notes from it. Um, so being on the professional level, as much as I'd love to use it, I, I, I don't have a centrifuge or anything to be able to, <laughs> to get that beer to clean up. So it takes a lot of use, time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It's, but it's, it's a nice yeast to use. Um, I never, I haven't done it, but obviously the yeast have come, the original strains have come from Scotland, so maybe you can try a Scottish yeast and see where that leads you. Um, hmm. That's an interesting aspect, so I've never never explored that one, so maybe I'll have to buy a, a little s- small test of that. Just so, to, so if you have plenty it. of time, use the Belgian yeast, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it did ferment fairly well, but you can use – so there's a few other yeasts, and we use the West Mall strain here at the brewery, and that's just a nice workhorse. We can do quite a few different varieties with that, um, and we're, uh, 
we're happy with that strain. The, the Le Chouf is another one. We didn't mention that in the beginning, but that's another Golden Strong that, that has spices in it. And that's another aspect that you can do um, to get some character out of the beer um, and add some of those spicy notes back is use of Grains of Paradise um, to give a little bit of character to it. I think uh, Le Chouf might use a few spices. I don't know if it's coriander I think they use in theirs. Um, mm. Just be very subtle with the spices. And if you can pick out the flavor of the spice, you've used too much. It should be a background note. It should be a compliment. Um, you know, this beer style is pretty much, uh, as they say, making artwork with a chainsaw. You can easily overdo it. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's you know, there's a lot of delicate things. It's, you know, the beers, especially with the, all the hop, hoppy beers, you know, everybody thinks more is better. And I think this is a nice beer that you can come restrained in. The other thing that's pretty much a lot of is sugar. And that's the reason to keep it nice and clean. Well, what about fermentation schedules? I, I've heard that some people like to ferment theirs a little warm. Is that? Uh... Yeah, I wouldn't start off warm. I'd start off around 66, um, 68, right around there. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the, as the days go through fermentation, it's warm it up. And you make sure you want to end it out, uh, you know, um, fairly warm. Mm -hmm. I, if I can, I end mine out about 75. Um, uh, just that to, is pretty the, well. It, most of the yeast is is done its work, and the main thing is to finish off those last few extra points, um, and make sure you, you've dried it out as best you can. Uh, and that's the reason for warming it up. Uh, but if you start off fairly warm in the beginning, um, obviously yeast is going to be really active, um, and you might have some fusels, so right. you, alcohol. So you want to make sure you start off clean, um, and you know, like treat this like a lager. You definitely want to. Um, uh, make sure you have a nice clean fermentation and plenty of yeast because it's it's a big beer and yeast love to eat the simple sugars first and then they'll go after the complex sugars. So if you don't have a good yeast pitch or healthy yeast, you will um, it'll stall out and you'll end up not fermenting all the way out. You can have some off flavors from the yeast giving up and and that's another thing you don't want. So healthy so yeast is very important. Definitely use a starter, huh? Yeah, or brew a nice single, you know, like a blonde with no sugar, you know, right around 1045, 1042, just a nice clean Belgian beer. Um, and then now you'll have a nice table beer that you can drink lots of, and you can let this one um, age and mature as, as, as well you're drinking the, the lighter one. Well, that's another issue. You mentioned the Belgian uh, uh, yeast don't fall out very well. Uh, do you yeah. have any ad advice on aging this kind of beer? You age it at a warm temperature, age it at a cold temperature, try and get it to crash or what? Uh, we do, I mean, uh, they do clean up after a few weeks, um, and the flavors do continue to change for, um, at least on our end, for about five weeks. And if it's hard for us to hold on to them for that long before we put them out, but sure. um, we do what we can. Um, so I did find some reference on Duval's webpage. They do quite a bit. It's a, it's a long process. It's um, 90 days from start to finish um, for them. It's obviously about an eight-day, seven-day fermentation. Um, they go through um, a lagering phase for about 20 days, mm -hmm. uh, and then they bottle um, on day 30. So they and do then, actually take it cold, huh? Before yeah. they, do they actually obviously, cold crash it, or do they just, just slow it down? I'm sure they just you know lower it down. I don't know. They call it a maturation or lagering. Lagering phase, phase yeah. yeah. so they do lager this beer to, it, and help settle the yeast out, I'm sure. Sure. Uh, and then they bottle. Then they two weeks sits in a warm room, and then for six weeks is in a cold cellar before it goes out. Hmm. So that's it's a long time to hold on to a beer. So, you know, these are bottle-conditioned beers, uh, and that's that adds a whole other layer of time. And you want to make sure that you, uh, um, if you are going to bottle these ones, you want to be able to make a beer that's going to present well you're going to need a nice belgian style bottle or something a little thicker than your regular you know 22 or 12 because you want some some nice carbonation levels and, and you're looking right around three to four and a half volumes of co2 which is quite a bit that's a lot most, yeah most beers around two and a half so it's another thing if you can cold condition this beer get off the main yeast um and then bottle with some new sugar and some new bottling yeast um, so you're adding yeast at the bottling, obviously, too, because you've already cold crashed yep. the beer, right? Yep. Obviously, we keg most of our Belgian at this point. We are going right. to be bottling, excuse, excuse me. But um, we just bottled our Belgian triple, and we do cold condition it, 
and crash it and then pump it to another tank, add sugar, and we do add another yeast. We we use a dry yeast at that point because it's... Um, You're just it, trying to carbonate, right? Yeah, and it's a clean. We know there's no true, there's no proteins in it. It's not going to... Um, and most of the, the dry yeast at this stage of brewing are, are pretty amazing. You know, they're, they're clean flavored, so I'm not worried about anything on those. And it, yeah, it's easy for me to calculate... Um, Pitch yeast pitch on dry scale, we can do that much easier than liquid scale on the on a bottling line. Sure. Um, do you have other suggestions about bottling or, or aging or or finishing the beer out? Um, I would recommend it. Presentation's a big thing on this, so I would say make sure if you can do the Belgian styles or they have the nice Belgian ones that'll hold a, a cap now. Um, just a little recommend a thicker bottle. Um, like I said, carbonate it up. Uh, to at least three and a half. Um, that's a good number to shoot for. You can go more if you want more. Be careful when you start going above four and a half. Um, you'll even at cold temperatures you could have gushers, um, and those are uh, those are no fun. And do you actually serve it in the taller taller glass? I assume. Well, yeah. There's the the tulip shaped glass is right. the, the one you can serve it in. Um, you know, it's almost nice and bubbly like a champagne. It's got a nice carbonic bite to it. Um, you know, the with the extra carbonation levels, the the hop aromas do come out. Just the small additions that you put in the yeast flavors. It's just a nice all around beer. So, um, don't forget about presentation on this style. It's it's a beautiful beer. So you get around to tasting the beer. Uh, what does a good Belgian strong taste like? Um, obviously presentation is the first thing you're going to see a nice foamy white head, um, lacing on the side, clear as, um, clear as it can be. Um, cloudy is not, you know, people most, a lot of people say that, you know, the cloudiness doesn't affect their perception or, or judgment on a beer. And, and I, I don't think that's as a home brewer, I understand that's, you know, it's not going to affect the flavor, but it's presentation's nice to have a nice clear beer. And this is a style that's, especially the paler beers, you want to be able to see through them. Um, so if you can get it brilliant, that's that's great to be able to do that. And I think time's about one of your thing on your side for this style. Uh, you know, you, you'll have some little bit of effervescence, the yeast aromas, the fruitiness, the spiciness comes through in the flavor. Um, finish is fairly dry. You shouldn't have any astringent alcohol flavors. You'll have a little bit of alcohol warming. Um, it's deceptively easy to drink, and that, that's where the name, obviously, Duval and Devil and all the Devil connotation names um, could be, come from because of the fact that it's it's an easy drinking beer, and you can give it to a. We take this beer to beer festivals, and it, you really need to take one beer. It's it's pretty funny. Somebody will come up, and I want a light beer, so you give them this. And somebody wants, I want a strong beer, and you give them this, and they're they're both happy. It's it fits both gamuts. It's um, it's just uh, easy to drink, and still has a nice complexity of of flavors. You don't want it to be too bubble gummy or too um, too spicy. It, you know, those are those fine things of having a nice balance of beer, and and that's your yeast fermentation and your temperatures are going to control some of those. So if it's too yeasty, you know, maybe you need, maybe it, you, it's too warm. So, you know, maybe next time make it a little cooler and see where that leads up. Well, um, you joined us back in episode 57 and talked a little bit about your, uh, your latest project, which is Braz Brewing Company. Um, I was wondering if you could just bring us back up to date. Uh, how are things going? Very well. Um, we're up and running. I don't think we were just in the middle of, uh, uh, getting everything about done last time we talked, and uh, it's going extremely well. Um, we're uh, doing some barrel age projects already. We, you know, that was one of our goals in the very beginning to be able to do some um, of the Belgian styles and the more eclectic ones. Yeah, the, I see the, the barrels water. in the background there. Yeah, yeah, those those aren't full. Those are we f- fill them with water to make sure they don't leak and and um, you know clean them up and, and make sure they're all good. Uh, before we stick them in our barrel room. So we have a few going right now. We got a couple of barrels of 100% brat, uh, three barrels with uh, three different fruits and some more bacteria. We got cherry, we got blueberry, we got raspberries. We have a Flanders red and a couple more barrels. And we're getting ready to do um, a blonde ale, um, which we just picked up some yeast from East Coast Yeast Company. East, they do um, Al B. Make some amazing uh, farmhouse yeast and sour yeast and brac- uh, Britannomyces. So we're excited to get um, get some of that yeast and, and see where it leads us. So 
Um, so that end of the is is going really well, and obviously those are time beers that we just kind of make and and wait to see where they go. Yeah, more specialty uh, beers. Yeah. And hey, what about the mainline business? Oh, yeah. What are you producing now? Um, we do uh, quite a few different IPAs. We do mm -hmm. um, seasonal IPAs, and they're all totally different. They're not just different varieties of hops. The the malt bills different. You know, the the summer was light and refreshing at six and a half. The winter was. Uh, the, the fall was more autumn color and um, about 7%. Uh, we're just getting ready to brew our winter IPA this week, um, and that's going to be more a uh, little fruitier, a little bit more of the new varieties like Mosaic and, and Citra, and, and we're going to play around some Eldorado and, and uh, see where that beer goes and make it more of a, a new variety. So, you know, we do, we're playing with different hops on the IPAs, so that's always a fun thing to do. And, uh, it's it's going really well, and then our we do have our our nice Belgian lineup is a Belgian, you know we have a Belgian triple that I said that we bottled and, and that's on tap, and that's the window of opportunity and that's eight and a half percent and that's really nice. We got a blonde, we got a double, um, what else? We got a Belgian amber we made, um, and we're getting we did a golden strong that's the inf in furnace um, which is Latin for hell obviously a little homage to the to the the Belgian <laughs> brewers and. And that one went over very well. So it's it's nice that, you know, I always said in the back of my mind, it'd be nice to make more Belgian-style beers because there's not that many people doing it and seeing how the public responds to that. And, and they seem to have responded fairly well. So it's it's nice that we're growing more and more of our Belgian styles. I think that there's not that many out there as as far as um, on the West Coast and brew pub atmosphere. You'll see one or two on the board of Blonde or or something like that, but we want to have at least three or four different Belgian styles. So, but we're we're doing really well. We're now, where growing, can people but, where can people find your beers? I think we mentioned the website, which is uh, Mraz Brewing Company, M R A Z Brewing Company dot com. But where else? Um, we do have a few accounts in the local area. We're in Northern California. We're in El Dorado Hills. Um, so obviously, our tap room. Um, we're closed Monday, Tuesday, but every other day of the week we're open. Um, you can uh, stop by the tap room and have a few uh, few pints or tulips. Uh, yeah, where's that located for people that are local? Um, it's uh, El Dorado Hills, and it's 2222 Francisco Drive, Suite 510. So you can look us up on the website and uh, you know, give me a call and say hello or uh, just please stop by. <laughs> so what do you got planned for the future, Michael? Um, we're doing more and more of the barrel age, uh, beers. So that's nice. And just continue to grow. We, we started with a three barrel system. Now I, I just acquired a five gallon kettle. So, um, we have 10 barrel fermenters. So now it's a, a two day brew instead of a three day brew. Um, and, and we're just looking to get some more fermentation tanks so we can, uh, do a little bit more of the bottling lines and have some more dedicated tanks for the, the Belgian style beers so we can start bottling more and more of those. So that's what we're looking for. And we're, uh, putting more of our sour beers out. Mm -hmm. We did put together a barrel membership program, sort of like a, a wine club. Um, you know, a lot of the breweries, everything's becoming so popular now it's, I, and I don't personally have time. I'm still a beer geek like everybody else, and I, I love go searching out for something special. And we have just down the street, it's two hours away, is Russian River, and they just released their um, their beatification, which is their spontaneously fermented sour beer. And it's I can't get up there to get it. It's pretty much wait in line, and then they're gone <laughs> fairly quickly. So um, I, I always thought it would be nice to have like a membership program. Um, that people that have been with us from the beginning um, be able to get a few of the bottles. And, you know, we can, at least in the state of California, we can ship in the state of California. We can't ship out of California. Sorry for most of the other viewers. Not the, yet, huh? United States. Yeah, we'll have to see what the TTB allows on that end. Um, it becomes an issue of going through a distributor, and, it, and it, it's, it's out of my hands at that point. But for California, um, we can do that. So that's... We're looking forward to that. That's a whole other step. And we just, you know, we started just doing stuff out of the tap room, small three-barrel brewery, um, and see where that led us and making sure we're, we're sustainable at that level. Um, we have about 20 outside of accounts um, that we distribute, we self-distribute beer to, and we kind of, you know, got that. And we can, we have people that, you know, have been wanting our beer that we can't get to, so we need to make more, and that's a good thing. And now we have a third leg as we're starting to do some of the bottles and some of the sours. So we have our hands in a little bit of everything. Um, 
Uh, and have you have you spent it, spent much time thinking about the next level? Uh, maybe moving up or uh, going to commercial brewing. Uh, um, as far as like full production brewing, yeah, yeah, producing. Yeah. Um, well, we do do outside of outside accounts, so we do a little bit of that. Um, not a full production brewery. You know, that's maybe years and years down the line. The next few years, we're looking to be um, just acquire some more stainless tanks. Um, get our bottling stuff taken care of and supply our local area. I don't necessarily see great ambitions to be distributing all throughout the, the country. Um, you know, if that happens the next five years, great. If it doesn't, we're happy where we are. Um, and it's, it's a nice thing to do what you, you love doing. And I'm happy doing that. It's, I was going to say, are you doing it full time now? Yep. yep. This is my full time. Congratulations. Full-time yeah. So it's, it's a fantastic. lot of work, but uh, I don't think I'd do anything else. With that big lottery, so we were, had a conversation. It's like, what would you do? It's like, I don't think I'd change. I mean, I'd have a few more, <laughs> few more cars and a few more pieces of stainless around me, but, you know, big <laughs> tanks. And, but I, don't, I think I'd continue to, to make beer. I, I enjoy it too much, and I enjoy the people. It's, it's great to have um, people come in and, and talk and conversate, and, and uh, it's just a great thing. Yeah, it's a great community. Yeah. Uh, Was well, there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think we covered the style fairly well. If um, you have any questions, or you can email me, uh, marazbrewing dot uh, brazbrewing at packbell dot net. You can get to that email address uh, on my webpage. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. And thank you, Brad, for uh, putting the podcast out there. They're I love you know I love them. They're informative, and uh, the gamut of guests are are very nice. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, we just launched uh, Beersmith Radio this week. Uh, beersmith.com slash radio we're actually streaming the podcast 24 7 now all uh let's see this will be 72 episodes so yeah. so kind of cool if you go to beersmith.com slash radio you can listen to that uh well again michael thank you so much for being on the show it's great to have you here again and uh uh sour beer expert uh <laughs> home brewer pro brewer uh twice uh, california home brewer of the year uh michael moraz uh really appreciate you being here thank you brad Everybody Thanks. have a good Christmas. I guess you'll get this after Christmas. So have a yeah, safe be, and happy Yeah, it'll be a happy new year by the time the, the show year. comes out. Go. But uh, happy new year to everybody, and I uh, hope you enjoy 2014. Thanks, That's Mike. That's for sure. You too. Bye. Well, a big thank you to Michael Moraz for appearing on the show. Really appreciate him being here. Again, wanted to hit the uh, three big announcements for this week. Uh, Beersmith Radio at beersmith.com slash radio, where you can listen to the podcast streaming 24-7. And second announcement, uh, updated videos at beersmith.com slash video. Hope you enjoy those. And the third announcement, of course, our new sponsor at CritterCutter.com. CritterCutter is a great gadget for opening all of your bottles, a nice tool to hand, have around, and it uh, makes a great attachment for your keychain, CritterCutter.com. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.